Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Dale Franson, director of the Eli and Edith Broad stage, whose 500-seat state-of-the-art theater anchors a performing and visual arts complex at the Santa Monica College Performing Arts Center. Franson transitioned to a leadership role in arts education after a 20-year career as a professional opera singer as a lyric soprano. While teaching voice at Santa Monica College, she designed its opera workshop program and organized many successful master's classes featuring leading opera stars. For the last six years, she has held the position of director of this $45 million visual and performing arts center that broke ground in 2005. Dale has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Dale, for joining us today. My pleasure. So you start off with a passion for this music, for opera. You have a career that is on stage and is all about voice and performance. And then you transition into this other role, which is about the performance of others and the interaction of audience with performance. How did you start your career? How did you end up getting into the, this world of, of classical and contemporary performance? It's really funny. When I first started doing this position, I thought, this is so weird, an opera singer doing something like this. And then, of course, I thought back and realized that my role model as an opera singer was Beverly Sills, who, of course, went on of course. to run New York City Opera and then be on the Lincoln Center Opera Board and was involved in education, arts education, all the way through her career. So she was my actually my role model both as a singer and now as a director. But then I discovered along the way that there are many other leaders of major arts organizations who are actually artists. Um, in the paper today, I'm sure you saw that Renee Fleming has just taken a creative consultancy job at the Chicago Lyric. Tom Hampson has a, is a residence at uh, the New York Philharmonic. I think that an artist running an arts organization is a great thing, not as, not as strange as it sounds, and in some ways our lens into how things should be done is very, very different. I built this theater with another artist, with Dustin Hoffman, and we built it from the stage out. Most theaters are built from the audience in. But we would stand on the stage looking out and think, well, how would an actor feel here? How would an opera singer feel here? How would a dancer feel here? I enlisted artists from the very beginning, people like Placido Domingo and Mikhail Berezhnikov and, um, gosh, so many people, Marilyn Horn, many, many different people to help me understand what are the problems with stages? I knew my own problems based on singing in many, many, many theaters, but you know, what's the difference in the different genres? Because we knew it would be a multi-purpose theater. And hence the Broad stage. Exactly. As opposed to the Broad theater. Exactly. And it's, we're great at dance, we're great at jazz, we're great at vocal, we're great at, at uh, theater. It was really a multi-diverse vision but also encouraging a different experience, not an isolated experience, but a, a, an experience to be part of the performance in the performing venue, and, and then changing the performing venue to create a different type of interaction. I think that's totally true. And in fact, one of the things that I think differentiates us, I like to say we're small but mighty, mm -hmm. that intimacy at a theater is a very rare thing. Yes. Most theaters in America and most, yeah, exactly. They were built in the 60s, and they're big, fat theaters, and they're big. Right. The average size is 15 to 3,200. Dorothy Chandler, 3,200. Uh, the Amundsen, 2,200. We're 500. You and have it's to use a, monoculars to see the performers. <laughs> exactly. And, and it doesn't create a kind of social intimacy, which was the original purpose of going to the theater. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, the Broad stage? Yes. Um, when I was developing this project, my buddy Tom Hulse and I were talking one day, and I was telling him what my vision was, and he said, so what you're saying is you want to create an artist's sandbox. So in other words, it's not just for the audience to get in the sandbox and play, it's also for the artists. And we talked about that for years, and that actually became part of my initial marketing, you know, this idea of an artist's sandbox. Is this a place where artists can fail? Absolutely. Absolutely, and me too. Believe me, when I woke up Saturday morning, for the Jane Austen event, I, I had a moment of total panic. And I turned to my husband and said, oh my God, this could be a total disaster. Because it's the first time we did it. So you don't know how people are going to respond. You so know. it's a place where that, that makes it safe to fail. Yes. And to therefore create new 
ideas and new interactions. Absolutely, and I think that part of my job as the artistic director is to create that atmosphere, is to say to the audience that we try and do the best work we can do. Sometimes that work is safe and we know it'll work and go well, and sometimes it isn't, and that's part of the creative process, and we can't guarantee either. But if you are with us on the train, you know, if you're on the train with us or you're in the tent with us, you get to experience all of that. Um, for example, last year we started incubating some new musicals, which is part of our bigger vision. So we did Stephen Sater and Duncan Sheik, the winners of Spring Awakening, the Tony Award winners, incubated their new musical. Then in January, we're incubating Burt Baccarat's new musical. So we're beginning to do that kind of work. We let our board and our donors come in and experience some of that. And as you know, I mean, uh, for every 200 shows that get incubated, one might survive, or two. But if we don't do that work, nothing survives. So this is a place where the artist is an artist. The artist is not a celebrity. The artist is not the marketing object. It is the artist as, as the artist. Absolutely, and they have to have a place to come together. I mean, one of the things that's missing in Los Angeles is a feeling of community. Luckily, on the west side of Los Angeles, there's a huge amount of artists who live there. I mean, the entertainment industry lives there, but they're all there. Singers, rock and roll stars, you know, actors, dancers. There's, you can't believe who's there, and I'm, I'm always stunned at who I run into and who's there. But there's no place to really hang out together, and there's no environment like that. We did our soft openings the month before we opened, mm -hmm. and we took a total chance. I got, it was very funny, I got a call from Kent Nagano, the great conductor, who's a buddy of mine who's also on our artistic board. I sang with him many times. And he called me about a year before we opened and said, Dale, you have to open with something new. You can't, you can't just, that's how you have to open. And I said, what? I said, it's hard enough just opening this. I don't think I can open with something new. Take a chance. And, and so we came up with this crazy idea, which was called American Voices. And it was, it ended up being just insane. It was 20 actors on stage, Dustin Hoffman, Annette Benning, James Cromwell, on and on and on. Um, an 18-piece chamber orchestra conducted by Kent Nagano. And we had writers put together kind of the total story of our founding fathers, which included women, slaves, American indigenous people. I mean, so it was a very different vision. And then I said to Dustin, would you narrate it, thinking there'd be one narrator. And that grew into Dustin saying, no, we, we have to have more. And he brought along 20 of his closest friends. Then he directed it. And this was the first thing we did. I mean, you can't imagine. It was so over our heads. We barely knew how to run the theater at that point. But that is so wonderful. You, you have the literary piece of, of the writing. You have the creation of a new idea. You have an educational element. You have music. Um, it, it is a very intricate experience, and in terms of the educational mission of this particular venue, could you talk a little bit about how that informs not only your programming, but also the way you approach the stage? We have, um, and we've had from the very beginning, a very extensive arts education outreach community insight kind of program mm -hmm. that's very varied. We tend to do somewhere between 12 and 15 events a year which for us is huge. Um, our season this year is 109 shows, but our first year was only 45. Mm -hmm. But we've kept the educational part very consistent. So we do everything from an open rehearsal with Nadia Salerno Sonnenberg, uh, to a master class with Lynn Harrell, to a master class with Angel Romero, to an open rehearsal with Baryshnikov, to bust in events where we bring kids in, in particular underserved kids in Title I schools. And the idea is that not only are we responsible as a performing arts center to develop new audience, but we're also, res I think artists are responsible. I think that artists actually love to give back. There are very few artists who won't give back. I mean, you have to know how important it is for people to be touched, whether they're kind of hardened audience people or brand new. Being up close to an artist is a life-changing event. I mean, so, it just changes your life. So you're developing the art, you're developing the artists, you're making a market for the future of, of this art. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that, that so often appears to be neglected. Going to where you've already made your market is so much easier than mm -hmm. going to where you haven't made your market. And it's so easy to sit back and, and take the easy road. You know, and it's funny, my board chair, Austin Butner, who's actually 
a very interesting guy. He's also the board chair of CalArts, where I happen to graduate from. Um, he said to me, we're doing great, we're doing that. He said, but you have to keep doing that. So part of our branding, and that's a new word for me, I never really thought about that word till three years ago, but our branding is actually curiosity. And the idea that every year we will introduce something new. We may not do the same thing every year. If we have a dance series last year, I may not do it next year. It will depend on the artists that I can get and the opportunities. Uh, next year we're going to introduce some new things that we didn't get this year. And so we're very much trying to be fleet and opportunistic and as things come our way, introduce to our community new things. And I think that's the new way actually. I mean, yes, there are certain people that every year want to have a chamber music series or every year want to have this or every year want to have that. And they'll be kind of a basis to our programming. Right. But you know, a great opportunity comes up, we're going to seize that opportunity. So if part of your, your branding, part of your marketing is curiosity and questioning, who has the answers? The answers, that's an interesting thing. To, that's, I like that. That's an interesting question. I would say, I don't know. I'm going to answer you like a rabbi, right? <laughs> I don't know who has the answers. I think it's more important to ask the question. I think the other thing is, and you know, we're all struggling with this, all, uh, everybody who's an arts leader or running an organization is, well, what is a 21st century performing arts center? And it really is changing. What is live performance? What is live performance and what's appropriate? I mean, for instance, there's much more de a de of a demand now for speaker series, for literary series, for film series. That wasn't even part of the equation 100 years ago. Right. Nobody was interested in that. Nobody even asked for that. People ask for very different things. We find in our community, you know, which is a very interesting community, we have lots of underserved and lots of extremely entitled, wealthy, educated people. Both sides of that equation want to learn. They want to be educated. We started a film series this year in the ED called Films for Change. And I had no idea how it would go. It was just kind of a crazy idea that I liked and that someone brought to me and I said, well, let's try it. And I tend to try things in the ED because the cost is much less, mm -hmm. you know, so I can kind of experiment. So the first film was called No Impact Man. I don't know if you, it was a great documentary no, about yeah. a couple in New York who for one year decided not to have any impact on the environment. So we tied it to food, local food and organic in our community. Well, it went incredibly well. And what came out of it is that people want to discuss these issues and learn about them. We had Josiah Citron, who's a fantastic chef from Melise. He came, he provided food, he talked about the farmer's market. There was a whole kind of community element. Uh, Amelia Saltzman, who wrote the Santa Monica Farmer's Market Cookbook came. She's so, actually one of our donors. So are you a community center or are you a, 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 an arts uh, You know, somebody venue? just asked me that. I think we're both. I think we're, I, I think we're a performing arts center in the heart of a thriving community, so we have to serve all of that. We started as a small little thing in our community, and our community has stayed with us. I mean, I'm in my 12th year of this project now, and the same people that gave me my first 100,000 are still involved with me. And now we have many, many, many more people, but it still has that kind of cozy community feeling, even though we're doing world-class work. And how does funding work in terms of contributed, earned income, your relationship with uh, the college? How, how does that all work? We have, I, I know we have an extraordinary relationship with Santa Monica College because I've talked to tons of other people who are working in college settings. And it isn't a nice situation. It's actually very adversarial and very difficult. I, I just think I lucked out. I mean, first of all, Santa Monica College, I like to think of as the Harvard of community colleges. It's an extraordinary institution. At the time that I was hired, the president was an amazing Cuban immigre, Piedad Robertson, who's just a character. Her mother was an opera singer. She herself is a subscriber to the Phil, to the opera. I mean, she loves the arts. And she used to go around saying, uh, she hired me because she loves crazy people, which at the time I thought was not necessarily the right message <laughs> to send to people. But it was true. She was used to working with artists, mm -hmm. and she understood that we live outside the box, and we don't think about things in the way that a bureaucrat does. So we had an incredible relationship. She left two weeks after she retired, two weeks after we broke ground, which was devastating for me. Abs it was like I went from being you know, the chosen daughter to kind of a single mother without, without rent or something. And we had an interim president, so that was tough. And then we had a new president who inherited this project, which was very tough. 
we won him over, and he has become even more amazing than I ever dreamed, Dr. Chewy Sang. He's on my board. He is at performances all the time, and you know from that college presidents don't usually come to. Yes. If you're lucky, they come once a year. He's there all the time with his wife. He loves the performances. He just sent me a recommendation for next year's gala that we should do bluegrass <laughs> so he could wear a cowboy outfit. You know, he's totally into it. Um, and so my relationship with them, I, I would not have been able to do this project without them. I mean, to do a project like this in the private sector is, is so unbelievably difficult. So it's been great. It's been unusual. And it's so tempting to end up uh, fighting over, over donor relationships and, and priorities, particularly in a, in a very tough funding uh, funding. Relationship. It is, but I think the, the difference for us is, you know, we had never, this institution had never raised a lot of money and had never done something like this. So that's the good news, actually, because it, it's not like a major, we won't mention names, you know, Ivy League school or a larger four-year school that has 80 people in their development office and are fighting over every cent. They didn't have that. So actually, the kind of money we brought in, they'd never seen that kind of money before. And it's really transformed how they look at fundraising. And I was thrilled to be part of that, but uh, they also gave me a lot of freedom. You know, I was basically, they were so happy that I was raising money, they didn't put any limits on me. They were just like, go out and raise the money. So it's remained that way. And it's served the college, you know, I have people on my board who have, are in love with the college now and are helping the college. So it's been very much an open door thing both ways. Can you talk a little bit about how you interact with the board? You were saying before that, um, that you had just come from a um, interesting event. If, if you could describe <laughs> that. So, um, you know, I am very new at this. Uh, you know, I'm a former recovered opera singer, you know. So I've never run you a You still need your fix every I once in a while? I still need my fix every once <laughs> Yeah, actually, that's why I'm hoarse from just singing out this week. But um, so I've never run a board. So it was all, it's all been very new for me. My board chair, who's, it's so funny because Austin is as a very kind of dry but very funny guy. He said to me, you know, you, you were an arts organization. You should always do something performance-wise or something that shows who we are at each board meeting. So I was so happy he said that because I didn't even know that was okay. <laughs> so we started doing that and usually at every board meeting we have something. We might have, you know, a slideshow with YouTube things of the season. We might have an arts edu- We had um, members from the Gay Men's Chorus sing. So this year we just had our fundraiser and um, the name of the woman who shared it was Roseanne Ziering. And I went, so I woke up two days ago and went, Roseanne, Roxanne. You know, I thought, Roxanne, we can do that song. And she happens to love rock and roll music. So I sat, and I used to write these funny songs when I was raising money. So Dustin would come out and do a theatrical thing at our fundraisers, and I would sing a song. And we, that's how we raised our first $9 million. And, and it became like this thing where, where these you know, wealthy donors would say, well, I'll do the party if you sing that song and you bring <laughs> Dustin. So um, I did that for years. I was singing one the other day to my staff. We did a song at one of the first parties to a well-known tune that was, bread, bread, we need a lot of bread. Theaters are expensive things to build. You know, we would do things like that and we would sing these crazy songs. And I would do it all a cappella, you know, unless they had a piano. And I did that for a really long time, and so we did this song to Roseanne, and I had my staff be the broadettes in the <laughs> background, and even my, my board chair sang, and a couple of people on my board, and we gave them rattles. So it was just like this insane board meeting. But it made me realize, you know, there's no reason why a board, we have to constantly remind our board that they're not just there to approve a budget, you know, or just approve an audit right. or whatever. It has to be dynamic and interesting, and I've actually been spending a lot of time the last couple of months with a lot of people actually exploring, well, what is a 21st century board? And since everything that I've done has been flip-flop, that's just how I do things, right? I do everything backwards. We need to flip-flop the board. I mean, it, it shouldn't be just this static group where the staff and the director are really, in a way, afraid to have a dialogue with their board for fear they're going to dump more work on them. Because that's basically when you ask other people about their boards, that's what they say. It's okay to have a lot of ideas. It doesn't mean I can do all of them, and it doesn't mean my staff can do all of them. But the process of brainstorming, if, if 15 ideas come up, one of them might be great. And it might be an idea that we've never thought of, and it keeps them engaged. So we've been thinking a lot about that. 
in a sense, what you're saying is that leadership of an organization is, in many respects, an art, and in certain respects, a performing art. Um, you are performing um, for your audiences, for your constituents, for your board, um, and that dialogue is bi-directional. So are you in a live improvisational performance as you define the stage? I think so. I think so. I mean, I think that the world is changing so quickly. I get offered things now that, and this is the risk, every time you do something new, you have no idea if it's going to succeed. It can be a total flop. We started the Jane Austen unscripted show in the ED two years ago. And I remember going to my staff and saying, I saw this hilarious improvised evening of Jane Austen. I want to do it with a high T. And my staff um, literally looked at me. I felt like I was insane. You're, you're they crazy. just looked at me and said, <laughs> what? You know, a high T, Jane Austen? What are you talking about? And I said, trust me, it's going to be great. And I knew it was a huge risk, but I figured, what's the worst going to happen? You know, I flop, so what? It was sold out. I mean, the whole run sold out. We did 10 shows. People loved it. We've done it again last year, and we're doing it again this year. It's just so different. But when we first started doing it, it was almost impossible to describe what it was. And we have a great marketing team, Natasha Shreves, who's my marketing director. But that's challenging. You know, I'm going around the world seeing things. Sometimes I describe things to her. I sometimes think, God, she has no idea what I'm talking about. How is she going to sell this? So it is challenging. But one of the ways that she figures things out is YouTube, mm -hmm. Googling. I mean, this is the new world of marketing. Luckily, there's live examples of almost everything that I book now, with rare exceptions. And that has changed how we do everything. But sure, it's a huge risk. Every time you put on something new, you think, is anyone going to come? And if you're not afraid periodically, then you're not trying hard enough. Well, that's true. So I guess I'm doing well. <laughs> I live so, in constant fear. <laughs> I, you know what? I have to say, I'm pretty fearless as long as I don't think I'm going to bankrupt my institution, which you know, has occasionally been a fear. I figure, what's the worst thing going to happen? You know, when I woke up, I got through my fear of Jane Austen. The, our, I said, oh my god, this could be a disaster. And then I thought, it's one night. You know, we're, it's not and like then we're the next night. Exactly, it'll be it, it'll be a new night. Exactly. So I mean, how how bad can it be? We do have to kind of keep perspective of we are arts leaders. We're not, you know, we're not killing people. We're not doing horrible things. We're supposedly doing good things. Keeping the arts vital, keeping audiences engaged and part of the creative process, keeping artists excited. What a wonderful thing that you are accomplishing. And I'd like to thank you for your insights and thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's a total blast. Great to talk to you. Thank you, Deb.